I think everybody understands that if we want to achieve net zero, then we've just got to decarbonise transport and a lot quicker than uh, business as usual will allow. So the questions then come, what kind of basic framework or principles are needed for thinking about a coherent strategy to decarbonise uh, transport? What does the new technologies indicate are the right ways to think about this problem? And then the guts of the issue, how do we make sure that the proper infrastructures are in place? And actually, none of these three issues, the technology, the principles before that, and the infrastructure are straightforward, and none of them are yet uh, are properly integrated together. So let's start with the principles and start right at the top with net zero. According to the Climate Change Committee, when we get to zero, I'm quoting, uh, we will then no longer be contributing or causing climate change. No, not true. Of course we'll be causing climate change, uh, even if all the emissions are eliminated territorially inside the UK, as long as we trade with anyone else in the world and those imports include carbon intensive stuff. So if you want to be net zero, and this is going to become increasingly apparent as we get to 250 in transport and everything else, it needs to be net zero carbon consumption, not net zero carbon production inside the UK alone. Now, this is a very important point because almost everything we consume includes transport and transport costs. So transport isn't just about issues like trains and cars and buses and so on. It's about the guts of almost everything that we do in our economy. Almost everything has to move and it has an international dimension. So it's very important to have it up front. This is vastly more serious than simply fixing the roads, fixing the rail and fixing the airports and maybe a bit of shipping too. So just have that in mind about the scale of the challenge. Now, the, the, the second thing about uh, transport is that it's a USO. It's a universal service obligation. No citizen can participate in our society unless they have access to transport. And we know what transport poverty means to people in rural areas, people in deprived locations, when there aren't buses or any other form of accessible transport, and particularly to those who either cannot afford cars and rail or uh, simply are not able to access them. So it's not just about pure cost benefit analysis. It's not just about economic efficiency. It's about the basic necessities, the capabilities for all and every one of us to participate in society. So that's the second point to note. It's carbon consumption and it's about citizens and USOs. But the final bit is that it's about systems. And we've devised a whole uh, framework for analysing public investments, the Green Book and so on, and for how regulators behave on the basis of cost-benefit analysis, which looks at each project in its own right and in its own merits. So that matters, of course, that's important. But what really is going to drive decarbonisation is having a low carbon road, rail, air integrated system. And that requires planning, a very uh, old fashioned word nowadays. Competition can't do this alone. We can have competition to deliver what it is we've decided as a system we require and what should be provided through system regulation and system operators. And indeed, many of the changes taking place in rail and the Williams Review, etc., point exactly in that direction towards system based regulation and system based planning. So, those are some very important principles which are often simply ignored uh, moving on to the substance quickly of transport. But there's another part that's frequently ignored, although less so now, and that's all about technology. Now, of course, people understand about electrification and they understand about smart systems, but what they don't really take into account as well is just how far digitalization will drive the entire economy 
and therefore the choices that we have to make about whether we actually want transport, what form of transport we require and how we require to get from A to B. In a world of 3D printing, we can think about production much closer to the points of consumption. In a world of really smart fibre connectivity, we can think about doing the stuff at home without travelling miles. I no longer are going to fly anywhere, but I can do lots and lots of international conferences. And indeed, I can speak to you today because video technology, IT enables uh, something to happen now, which is uh, vastly superior than anything five years ago. The question was always out there with really good cons. Do we really need to travel? Well, I can tell you personally that some of the answer to that is no, not anymore, and that's fantastic. So the demand side changes, uh, the supply side will change through the electrification, and that brings us to the infrastructures. Infrastructures don't happen, transport infrastructures, because someone says, I'd like some transport, please. It's not like buying commodities uh, or the normal paraphernalia of our consumption. This is about making sure that I have the opportunity that should I want to travel, the infrastructure would be in place so I could make that choice. And that has to be centrally planned. Uh, overall, lots of local components to it, lots of regionalisation, but you have to have a map of where you're going in order to work out which bits you want to put in place. And when we look at regulation, it's precisely designed not to address the integration of transport into our digital world and into our economy in a decarbonisation context. The questions have changed and now we need different institutions to answer that. So we need to get on and build uh, an electricity network capable of charging enormous numbers of devices. We need an electric infrastructure that can actually do the digitalization of, of stuff, the internet of things, on top of the infrastructures for the roads and the railways and the airports and so on. We need decisions about whether to have long distance rail or regional air aviation. We don't need ad hoc decisions about whether to bail out Flyby. We need a coherent idea about how, for example, if you wanted to go from Exeter to London, you could avoid going by Flyby from Exeter to London City Airport and have a reasonable price train instead. These are the sorts of questions that come up. And the one central issue in infrastructure, which is not integrated with transport or energy, is the fact that the fibre networks are the premier and primary infrastructures of the future upon which everything else is going to depend. It's no good filling in the potholes. Now, that might be a good idea, particularly if you're on a bike and you try to go around Britain's rural roads or cut out a, a journey into work that you would have made in a car. Potholes are part of the frame, but what you really need to do is have the communications networks which enable smart, autonomous vehicles, uh, driverless vehicles in due course, coordination of road systems, all those things which come with a proper inter introduction into our transport world of the real meaning of the communications revolution that lies behind. And you know the way to think about this? is to think about in the 19th century and early 20th century how electricity came and how it's taken 50, 60, 70 years for electricity to become its full potential. Well, now we need that with communications. We need smart, modern rail and road infrastructures. So let's get the principles right. Let's get the understanding of technology right. And then let's put in place those infrastructures and let's get on with it now because there's very little time to waste, especially if we want to do net carbon and net zero carbon consumption, hugely more demanding than net zero carbon production, which in any event, we're not yet in a position to start to implement. So let's get on with it. It has to be done and it's the only way we're going to get this part of the decarbonisation story into place. Thank you very much.